Kia ora, good morning everyone, Rich Wong here, welcome back to the channel. So Panasonic Lumix GH6, I feel like I've been waiting forever for the GH6 to arrive. I think a lot of you will feel the same and now it has finally arrived. What are the specs? How does it perform? Is it worth the wait? Well, what about a brand new 25 megapixel sensor? Completely brand new processor? 10-bit 4K 120 video, 10-bit 5.7K 60p video, active cooling so virtually no overheating, internal ProRes HQ recording and future USB SSD recording, 100 megapixel handheld high res mode, improved autofocus system, 13 plus stop dynamic range using the new dynamic range boost feature, and many more. Firstly, I would like to say thank you to Panasonic for loaning me this pre-production GH6 and allow me to spend almost a month to test and prepare this review. So I have done a lot of testing and I will share the result with you guys. A lot of very nice results and a few average results. I know this is going to be a very long review. My scripts are 23 pages long. So I have created time index for this video and you could jump to a particular chapter if you want. But of course, I think you should just watch the whole video from start to end because I spent lots of time planning this review and trying to deliver all the information in a logical, sensible order. I also want to say thank you to Auckland Camera Center for the help again. If you're from New Zealand and need a new camera, definitely go check out their shop or their website. I have a link in the video description below. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm not holding a GH6 on my hand and just have the box here, it's because this video is recorded using the GH6 in continuous autofocus mode, human detection or face tracking, and audio is also recorded internally by the camera using a single D2 microphone through the Zoom F6 and then go into the camera. So. This is because I want you to be able to see and listen to the video and audio recorded by the GH6 as part of this review. And of course, if you found this review useful or enjoy watching me running in my garden testing the autofocus again, please give this video a like, drop a comment below, tell me your thoughts and that would be my biggest support. Okay, let's get started. The GH6 has a magnesium alloy body that is splash proof, dust proof and also freeze proof down to negative 10 degrees Celsius. The body feels very solid and it is also quite heavy for a Michael Forfurt's camera. The weight is 823 grams so that's about 100 grams heavier than the GH5 or the GH5 Mark II. But there's a good reason why it's heavier which I will tell you in a second. Look at the body and you can see some of the typical Lumix GH design easily such as the angled top edge on both sides of the EVF but the GH6 has a more boxy design and you can also see a lot of design elements borrowed from the Panasonic's S-series cameras. Size-wise, when I first saw the camera, I thought the GH6 is much bigger than the GH5 but actually the GH5 and GH6 width and height are very similar. However, the GH6 is just a lot deeper. Anyone pick up the GH6 will immediately notice that. And because of that, it does make the camera look and feel more chunky than the GH5. There are two main reasons why GH6 body is quite a bit deeper. Firstly, the grip. GH5 has a very decent size grip but GH6 grip is larger. After using the GH6 for a few days and when I go back to the GH5, I was surprised how much better the GH6 grip is in comparison. The deeper grip and the shape just make it more supportive and feel better when you hold the camera. The other reason is that the LCD screen is now extruded a bit from the back of the body. And that is mainly because the GH6 now has active cooling. Yes, there is a cooling fan and ventilation system behind the sensor just like the Lumix S1H. Another small reason is because GH6 has a tiltable and fully articulated screen. 
guess what? Just like the S1 Edge again. So you can flip out the screen and rotate it just like the GH5, but you can also tilt the screen up by about 30 degree, but not done. And when you tilt it up, there is some kind of locking mechanism that holds the screen. You will feel a click when it reaches the maximum angle, and that somehow feels more satisfying compared to the tiltable screen on other cameras. I guess a lot of photographers will love that tiltable screen as you can now tilt the screen up very easily. And actually I found even when I'm shooting videos, especially when the camera is on the tripod, very often I would just tilt the screen rather than flip it out and rotate it as it's just so much faster. Another advantage of having a tiltable screen is that it would push the screen slightly further away from the body. That means even when you have the HDMI and USB cable connected on the side, you can still fully rotate the screen without it being blocked by the cables. It is a fantastic design and I guess the only thing that is missing is the ability to tilt down when shooting from a high angle. But I am okay with that as I can still flip the screen out and rotate the screen down if I need to hold the camera above me. The LCD screen itself has the same specs as the one on the GH5 Mark II, 3 inch 1840K dots. I'm not too sure if it's exactly the same one as the GH5 Mark II though because the color seems a bit different. And just like the GH5, you have many different assist tools that you can enable and overlay on the screen or the EVF, including some additional one like the IS status scope from the Lumix S cameras, safety zone marker, and you can have the magnifying view when recording video. I know this is one thing that a lot of you really want, especially if you shoot with many focus lens a lot. And let's have a look at the buttons and controls layout. Look at the top of the camera. With the GH5, we have five similar size buttons very close to each other, which means you can press the wrong button easily, especially if you are shooting with the EVF. Now with the GH6, the white balance, ISO, and exposure compensation buttons are sitting slightly higher and more to the front. The red video record button is moved to the very back and the function 1 button is replaced by a new audio button which by default will show you the audio information. But it is customizable so you can use it as a normal function button if you don't really care about audio so much. This button layout is very similar to the Lumix S series camera and definitely an improvement compared to the GH5 as the buttons are not so close together anymore. The front dial is still a vertical one just like the GH5 and the rear dial is now again the S series style. The two mode dials are largely the same. The most noticeable difference is with the dial on the left, the 4K, 6K photo modes are gone. Yes, all the 4K, 6K photo modes are no longer available on the GH6. I think some users might miss that. Instead, we have a new high resolution mode on the dial, which is something really should be there a long time ago. As the previous Lumix camera, you have to go into the menu to enable the high resolution mode shooting, which I found a bit weird. And yes, the GH6 has high resolution photo mode and it supports handheld too. And I will talk about that more very soon. On the right dial, the creative control mode, the mode that you can choose different filter is no longer there. I don't really mind that it's gone as I wonder how many GH users would actually use that mode. With the creative control mode is gone, Panasonic replaced it with another custom setting mode C4. Look at the front, we finally have two function buttons next to the lens mount and there is a new front video recording button which I found very handy when I'm filming YouTube video here in my studio. Yes, I have already recorded four reviews using the GH6 so far because the best way to test a product is keep using it in different ways so that's one of the things that I did over the last few weeks. There's also a front teddy lamp up there and a rear one too at the back and they are both reasonably bright that I can see very easily even when filming outdoor during the day. 
The flash sync port at the top can also be used for sending and receiving time code. That's really great if you shoot with multiple cameras that support time code as you can sync the footage from each camera easily. A BNC conversion cable is also bundled with the camera. Now let's check out the back of the camera. The button and control layout is quite a bit different to the GH5. It's a lot closer to the S series. To me, the biggest improvement is the display button is no longer on the right side near the grip that I accidentally press all the time on the GH5. There is a lock switch for you to lock some certain controls that you can customize. The little joystick now can move the AF pawn diagonally, which I know is a feature a lot of people have requested. The position and the shape of the EVF looks pretty much the same as the GH5. I remember when the GH5 came out, I was really impressed by its EVF. It was much better than most other cameras in the market. So this time I was really hoping to see a new EVF and I'm a bit disappointed because it seems like it is more or less the same EVF. 3.68 million dots, 0 0.76 times OLED panel. It's not any higher resolution or faster refresh rate compared to the EVF on the GH5. To be fair, apart from the just released OM system OM1, most other mirrorless cameras around the same price or even more expensive are using very similar EVF. But I just really hope Panasonic would wow us with a new EVF. I do notice one potential issue with the EVF in terms of usability. Since the LCD screen is now extruded quite a bit from the back of the camera and the shape and position of the EVF is pretty much the same. So when you are shooting with the EVF, your nose may get pushed by the screen a bit more than it used to be. I don't have a big nose, so that's not really a problem for me but it could be a bit of hassle if you have a bigger nose. On the left of the camera, we have a few connection ports, the full-size HDMI, USB, mic and headphone ports. The position of the HDMI and the USB port is now swapped compared to the GH5, so the USB port is actually at the top while the HDMI port is at the bottom. I guess maybe the reason is because the USB port on the GH6 is a lot more important and has different ways that you can use it so that's why they put it above the hdmi port the hdmi port can output 4k 120p if you use a supported hdmi 2.1 cable if you have shot with gh5 or gh5 mark ii using external monitor you probably know there is some noticeable latency when you connect to an external monitor using the hdmi port it isn't too bad if you are shooting relatively slow scene, but if you shoot fast action, you will notice it. So with the new processor and the other new hardware, I was curious to see if this has been improved. So I measure the HDMI output latency of the GH6 and compare with the GH5 Mark II. Unfortunately, the result figures I got seems pretty much identical. My results suggest there is around 120 to 130 millisecond HDMI latency when recording in 4K30, which is more or less the same as the GH5 Mark II. When I was testing the latency, one thing I noticed is the latency for the external monitor would drop to around 60 to 80 millisecond when I'm recording in the higher frame rate such as 4K60 or 4K120. That is around half the latency compared to 4K30. So if you feel the HDMI latency is a bit too much with the GH6, try shooting in higher frame rate and see if it's any better. The USB port is upgraded to USB 3.2. 10 gigabit per second one, which can be used to charge or deliver power to the camera using a PD power supply. You may wonder why do we need a 10 gigabit per second port that's really high bandwidth. And it's because there will be a future firmware update to allow you to do a USB SSD direct recording, which means you can plug in a SSD drive to the USB port and record video externally without using an external recorder. Let's have a look at the other side of the camera. 
we have the dual card slots and it is one CF Express Type-B card and one SD UHS-2. One very nice thing about the card slots is if you open the memory card slot door and the camera is still writing some photos or finishing off writing the last bit of video file to the camera, then there will be some beeping sound and also a flashing LED light to warn you to wait until the ride is completed so you won't accidentally yank out the card when you shouldn't. Now I guess it's not surprising Panasonic used CF Express card as they have already done that on some of the S series cameras and the CF Express cards are getting cheaper and more popular. And it's also not surprising Panasonic keep one SD card slot so people upgrading from the GH5 can reuse their high speed SD cards. However, I do wonder if it really is the best choice for user as it does create some limitations when it comes to video recording. Some of the highest quality video format can't be recorded to the SD card and therefore you can't write the video to both card slots to create a backup copy if you choose some of those high bitrate video format. But luckily Panasonic has made a few changes to make it a little bit better and I would talk about that in a minute. If you want to format the CF Express card, there is a new low level format option available which is something I have never seen on other cameras before. The last thing I want to mention is the tripod mount. Now it has an additional hole so you can use it with tripods or quick release spray that has the anti-rotation pin to stop the camera from being rotated. So overall, I think the body of the GH6 is fantastic with really good ergonomic and it is like Panasonic used the GH5 as the base and they mix in some new stuff from Panasonic's S-series cameras and this is the film that we will see a few more times throughout this review. The Lumix GH6 uses the BLK22 battery. It is a 2200mAh battery that was introduced by the Lumix S5 and also then used by the GH5 too. You can use the BLF19E battery from the older GH cameras if you want, but if you use it, there are some certain limitations. The video recording quality is maximum cinema 4K and you cannot record any video faster than 60 frames per second. And the battery life is also lower than the BLK22. In terms of the battery life when using the BLK22 battery, I find it is okay, quite similar to the GH5. With my typical usage that shoot a mix of video and photos, one battery usually lasts a few hours. I also try recording 4K 120 video using a fully charged battery and it can record almost exactly one hour of 4K 120 with IBIS turned on and autofocus set to continuous autofocus. A charger is included in the box but you can also charge the battery or supply power using the camera's USB port. According to Panasonic, the charging time no matter you use the charger or the camera's USB port are the same and it is 230 minutes. I bought a third party dummy battery for my S5. When I tried it on the GH6, that kind of works okay when filming video, even 4K 120 video works fine, but I do have issues when I try to take photos. So yeah, I think if you want to power your camera using AC power, the safest option is to use a good PD USB power source. One thing the GH5 is really good at is the amount of video recording formats options that you can choose. And the GH6 is even better with more options available. Just the number of video recording formats that you can choose when the system frequency is set to 59.95 is already 10 pages long. That is almost 50 different recording formats. There are so many different output resolution, different frame rate, different codec and different bit rate. Some options are not very common but are actually very useful. For example, if you like to shoot in 24p, you can also choose 48p instead. If you choose to shoot in 48p, it allows you to convert your footage to 24p very easily and play at normal speed without any frame skipping issue 
or you can make it a two times slow motion footage easily when you want to slow down a particular part of the footage. And we also have some extra variable frame rate options that you can choose from a different settings menu. So there's a crazy amount of recording formats that are available for you to choose. So it could actually be a bit of pain to scroll through all the different options to find the one you want. And you could easily choose the wrong format too if you are not careful. Fortunately, Panasonic has borrowed another feature from the S1 Edge, which is you can now add your favorite recording format to your own list so you can find them easily. And you can also apply filtering and specify your preferred frame rate or resolution or codec, etc. to filter out the video format that you don't want. And in terms of output resolution, you can choose from 1080p to 4K, Cinema 4K, 4.4K, 5.7K and 5.8K. Just like the GH5, GH6 also has built-in anamorphic video support. You can film with an anamorphic lens and use the anamorphic discrete display feature to show the video correctly on the camera screen. There is also the anamorphic image stabilization feature, so the image stabilizer will work correctly with the anamorphic lens. GH6 supports 1.3, 1 1.33, 1 1.5, 1.8, 2.0 times anamorphic lenses. If you shoot your anamorphic video in 5.8K resolution, the camera basically captures video from the whole sensor, full width, full height, and the output video would be in 4 to 3 aspect ratio before you de-squeeze it. You can record the 5.8K footage at up to 30 frames per second in 10-bit color depth. If you want to go higher frame rate, you can shoot in 4.4K and that would allow you to go up to 60 frames per second and still in 10 bit. But if you record in 4.4K, it is not using the full sensor. But even if you don't have anamorphic lens, there are still plenty of reasons to shoot in 5.8K. The great thing about the 5.8K apart from higher resolution is that it's recording video from the full sensor to give you a 4 to 3 aspect ratio video. So if you want to output your video contents to different platforms, maybe Instagram, TikTok, which is either one-to-one -one or vertical video, or you want to do a video capture to create a 3 to 2 or 4 to 3 aspect ratio photo, the 5.8K 4 to 3 aspect ratio video after cropping would give you more resolution. Even if you are outputting to the normal 16 to 9 4K footage, shooting in 5.8K also allow you to add a bit of zoom or vertical pan without losing any resolution. But if you really want to shoot in 16 to 9 aspect ratio, you can shoot in 4K or 1080p. And if you want to shoot in the 17 to 9 aspect ratio, you can shoot in 5.7K or Cinema 4K. With 4K or Cinema 4K, you can record in 24, 25, 30, 48, 50, 60, 100 or 120 frames per second. 4 to 0 10 bit is available for any frame rate. 4 to 2 10 bit is available up to 60 frames per second. There's no cropping for any of the 4K or Cinema 4K recording even at 120 frames per second. But if you want, you can do a pixel to pixel crop which is around 1.5 crop to give you a tighter field of view from your lens. The 10-bit 4K footage from the GH6 looks super sharp, super detailed and there doesn't seem to be any drop in image quality even when filming at 4K 120. The 420 4K 120 video from the GH6 appears to be pretty much just as nice as the 422 4K 30 video. If you want to shoot in 1080p, you can go up even more to maximum 240 frames per second when recording in HFR mode. However, continuous autofocus is not available when recording in 200 or 240 frames per second. And if you record in variable frame rate mode, VFR, you can go even faster. You can capture 1080p 
at maximum 300 frames per second and it is using the full sensor width and you can record it in 10-bit 420. One thing I find quite interesting is when shooting in 1080p, if I choose the pixel pixel crop, the maximum frame rate I can choose is now only 120 frames per second. If you are a bird photographer or shoot wildlife, then sorry, you cannot use the pixel pixel crop mode to get extra rich if you want to shoot 1080p footage at 240 or 300 frames per second. In terms of quality, the 1080p footage shot from 24 frames per second up to 120 frames per second all look very nice, very clean and very detailed. When I compare the 1080p video with the 4K video, the 4K video are of course sharper and has more detail, but the 1080p video actually still look pretty nice. From 150 FPS onwards, the image quality of the 1080p video would drop a bit. It is not always very noticeable, but for this example footage, if you look at the diagonal lines and you can see the very high frame rate video are not as nice or detailed as the 1080p video shot at 120 frames per second or below. So what it means is don't go over 120 frames per second if you want the best image quality, but if you need to go higher, you could go all the way to 300 frames per second as the quality is the same. But to be honest, I would just shoot at the frame rate that I want. If 300 frames per second give you the effect you want, then go for it. When shooting real-world footage, most people wouldn't really notice the difference in quality between the 120 FPS and 300 FPS video, but everyone can see the difference between a slow motion video shot at 120 FPS and 300 FPS. Now, because some of the recording formats and features on the camera are pushing the limit of the hardware, so you cannot combine some of them together. For example, if you are recording in 4K 120, then the human or animal detection are not available. The dynamic range boost, which I will talk about next, is not available above 60 frames per second. But I think overall, the amount of limitations is not too bad compared to most other cameras in the market. Another new big improvement that comes with the GH6 is that you can now record internally in ProRes or ProRes HQ format. Right now, when the camera is released, you can record 5.7K video up to 30 frames per second in either ProRes or ProRes HQ format internally to the memory card. ProRes is a low compression, high quality codec, which is very easy to edit. So having the ability to record it internally is definitely great. So you don't need to rely on an external recorder. There's no mention of ProRes raw internal recording. And I guess most of us would know why it is. And it's definitely not Panasonic don't want to do that. But ProRes raw output to Atomos Ninja 5 Plus will come in a future firmware update. USB SSD direct recording will also coming in the future, so you can record to a USB SSD drive directly by connecting to the camera's USB port. Cinema 4K and 1080p ProRes and ProRes HQ internal write support will also come in a future firmware update. Now, because the ProRes formats are very high bit rate, so for example, the 30 frames per second 5.7K ProRes HQ is 1,900 megabit per second. I remember back when GH5 was released, we were all talking about the very high bit rate of the 10-bit 422-4K file that GH5 creates, and that is only 400 megabit per second. Now, the ProRes HQ can go to almost five times higher bit rate. The problem of such high bit rate, apart from you need a large memory card, is that it's not something the SD card can handle, at least not the current SD card can handle. Because of that, you could only write it to the CF Express cards, and you can't use a very slow CF Express card as well. I tried it with the Pagia 1TB CF Express card, which I've reviewed recently, and that works fine. But it does mean if you want to record in any ProRes format, 
you cannot write the video to two cards at the same time to have a backup copy. This also applies to some of the highest quality or intra format video as anything faster than 600 megabit per second, you can only record to the CF Express card. So that's why at the beginning I did mention that one CF Express card and one SD card configuration does create some limitations and we wouldn't have this problem if both card slots are CF Express card. However, Panasonic did do something to make it a bit better. For all those all intra codec options that are really high bit rate and can only be recorded to the CF Express card, Panasonic has also created a very similar alternative that is still all intra and pretty much exactly the same but at a slightly lower bit rate that can be recorded to the SD card as well. Those are the ones with the little L icon over the white box in the menu. That means you can still record all intra footage to both card slots if you want, but just not the ProRes or the ProRes HQ files. So if you ask me, I'd rather Panasonic put two CF Express card slots on the GH6, but that's just me. So what do you guys think? Especially if you are currently shooting with a GH5 and already have some expensive high speed SD cards, do you rather Panasonic go with both CF Express card slots? That means you have to buy all the cards again, or you are glad that Panasonic keep one SD card slot so you can reuse their card? Drop a comment below, let me know what are your thoughts. With the new sensor, the Lumix GH6 is the first Lumix G camera that can capture 13 plus stops dynamic range when recording video. But increase in the dynamic range is not just because of the sensor. GH6 has full VLOG picture profile, so it's not the VLOG L profile anymore. And it is a standard feature, so you no longer need to pay extra to unlock the VLOG. And there's a new feature called the dynamic range boost, which is basically allow the data from the image sensor to go through two different analog circuits in parallel. One is a low ISO circuit, which give you better saturation and also highlight details. And one is the high ISO circuit, which give you less noise. The camera's processor would then do a pixel by pixel composition to merge the output from these two analog circuits together to give you better dynamic range and image quality. And according to Panasonic, enabling the dynamic range boost would give the output video an additional stop of dynamic range. While this feature can be used when shooting in any picture profile, I don't really notice the difference when I'm recording using a normal standard picture profile. The difference is most apparent when you are shooting in VLOG picture profile because the VLOG picture profile is designed to capture high dynamic range. Have a look at this side-by-side -side comparison example. I have the GH5 Mark II and GH6 filming at the same time in VLOG L and VLOG Picture Profile with equivalent exposure settings at each camera's base ISO. With the dynamic range boost turned off on the GH6, the GH6 can retain slightly more highlight information. If you look at the area outside my window, you can see the difference. Now, if I turn on GH6 dynamic range boost feature, you can easily see the GH6 managed to retain quite a bit more highlight details compared to the GH5 too. When I repeat the same test and compare the GH6 with the GH5S, the result is the same. The GH6 with dynamic range boost enabled can retain noticeably more highlight details than the GH5S. Now there is a caveat with the dynamic range boost feature. Because the dynamic range boost rely on both the low ISO and high ISO analog circuit. So if you enabled it, the lowest ISO you can shot at becomes ISO 2000 when you're shooting in VLOG picture profile. I understand the reason, but I also wish we don't have to shoot at such a high ISO. 
But since most of you who shoot in vlog probably would use a ND filter anyway to control shutter speed, so I guess it is not too big a problem in real life. Okay, now let's talk about autofocus. It is probably what a lot of you are most interested in. So Panasonic designed to keep using pure DFD autofocus with the GH6. And with the new processor, Panasonic says the camera has three times autofocus processing power than before. Panasonic has also improved the DFD technology and they call it advanced AF, which really doesn't mean much. I'd rather they call it DFD 3.0 or something like that. But apart from telling us that the detection area has increased from 225 to 315 areas, there really isn't too much specific details about what or how the DFD autofocus is improved. What sort of performance should we expect? Now, of course, I did a lot of testing and running in my garden. But before I show you my autofocus test results, there are a few related changes that I want to talk about first. The first one, the autofocus mode are quite a bit different now. Previously, the human or animal detection can only be used in either the special human detection AF mode or enable it in the one area or one area plus mode. But with the GH6, the special human detection AF mode is gone. It's because you can now enable human or animal detection in any autofocus mode. This definitely makes the autofocus system a lot more flexible and you can also assign the detection to a custom button so you can enable or disable the human or animal detection anytime very easily. And this is great. For example, if you're shooting a wedding reception, I say it because I'm a wedding photographer, you may just rely on the human detection to lock on your target, but you suddenly want to focus on, say, the wedding cake in the foreground, or maybe there's a portrait photo on the wall, and the camera keeps thinking this is a real person, then you can just quickly disable the human detection and move the autofocus area around and use the autofocus area instead. And when done, you can quickly re-enable the human detection again. This is definitely much more flexible and much faster than the previous Lumix cameras. One thing I really like when shooting with the Lumix camera is if you are using face detection and the multi-metering, when the camera detects and focus on a person, it will adjust the exposure to make sure the human that you focus on is correctly exposed. The face priority exposure metering is great when you are shooting portrait or events because your subject will always be exposed correctly. However, in some certain situations, this may not be the behavior you want. For example, you may just want to do a smooth focus transition from the person in the foreground then to the background. Then when you change the focus area, the exposure will also change automatically as well. Of course, you can work around that by setting the camera to full manual mode so the exposure is locked. But with the GH6, there is an easier solution for those who just don't want the face priority metering. You can disable this in the menu. Just find the face priority in multi-metering option and set it to off. This way, the exposure won't change when you focus upon is changed from or to a person. There's also a new focus limiter feature. You can set the far and close focus limit, and that would not only increase the speed of autofocus, but also minimize the chance of focus hunting or focus distracted by some foreground or background object when you are shooting in a busy area. A lot of telephoto or macro lenses have this feature building on the lens, but the advantage of having this feature on the camera is that you can use it with any lens, you can set any distance you want, and you can also assign a particular focus limiter to each of camera's custom mode, so you can switch between them very quickly. For example, you're shooting concerts, from a dedicated area, 
then you can set one focus distance for shooting the performance on the stage far away and another focus distance for the crowd right in front of you. This way, the autofocus system won't get confused easily and you should be able to focus on your subject much quicker. Now, let's talk about autofocus performance. I'm not going to talk much about the AFS mode for taking photos because I think this is one area the DFD autofocus already performs very well. It's always fast and accurate and this is the same for the GH6. So I will just talk about the continuous autofocus performance. And first, there is a little bad news. If you are shooting photo in AFC mode, that micro background pausing effect is still there. When your subject is not moving, you will see the background would keep pausing slightly. Actually, it looks more like it's vibrating. Just to be clear, I'm talking about in photo mode, not video mode. And I don't think this pausing is actually causing any real issue apart from it looks a bit distracting. It definitely looks quite distracting. But I'm also not sure if this is something Panasonic can avoid with the current DFD autofocus system. I'm going to show you a sequence of photos that I shot with the GH6 and the Leica 2550 f1.7 lens. We went to a park in the weekend, my son was running towards me, so I shot this set of photos in high speed burst mode with continuous focus using human detection. And I shot all the photos at 50mm f1.7. The whole set of 15 photos were shot from start to end probably around 2 seconds and I was really surprised when I checked the photos and I found every single photo, the focus was spot on. And I also tried shooting some bird in flight photos using the GH6 with the Leica 50-200 lens and the results were also really good. When shooting bird in flight, not every single photo was in focus, but the overall keep rate is still pretty high and there is definitely some big improvement compared to any of the previous Lumix cameras that I have used. However, I do find one thing that I don't really like when shooting fast action in burst mode and it's the blackout between photos. Maybe I was just spoiled by the Nikon Z9 which I reviewed just recently and yes, I know the price of the Z9 is like 2.5 times the price of the GH6, so it's not really fair to compare them. But anyway, the breakout after taking each photo is really quite noticeable and Panasonic hasn't bring the no breakout shooting mode from the G9 to the GH6, so I find it a bit hard to follow fast moving subject accurately when shooting in burst mode. Apart from that, I'm happy with the continuous autofocus results that I got when shooting photos. So what about when shooting videos? Let's have a look at this side-by-side -side test that I did with the GH5 Mark II, which is my reference camera. Just in case you're not aware, GH5 Mark II's autofocus system already has some big improvement compared to the original GH5. Both footage were shot in 4K30 using human detection. I know a lot of you guys have been waiting for another episode of me walking in my garden, so go grab some popcorn now. The GH6 appears to be slightly faster in both detecting and tracking the subject. The difference isn't huge, and both cameras manage to track my movement reliably, smoothly, and respond fairly quickly. And when I'm not moving, I also don't see pausing in the background, which is great. In the past, we found out with Panasonic's DFD autofocus system, if you're recording in higher frame rate, it would also improve the camera's autofocus performance because you are giving the camera more information to work with. So I tried recording in 4K60 with the GH6 and keep the GH5 II at 4K30 as my reference camera. Interestingly, this time with the GH6, recording in 4K60 doesn't seem to make any obvious difference or improvement to the autofocus performance. Maybe there's some improvements, but from all the tests I did, it's not really noticeable if I compare it to 4K30.
However, when I change to 4K 120, the autofocus appears to be more responsive. It follows my movement quicker, but still keeping the same smoothness. I think it works great. And remember, the camera is still recording in full width in 4K 120, so no cropping at all. However, one thing I need to mention is, when GH6 is filming in 4K 120, human or animal detection cannot be used, so I have to rely on the normal autofocus mode. I was using the full area detection in this test, which is okay, as there's nothing closer to the camera than me. I also shot some birds in fright video in 4K 120 and it works reasonably well too. But without human or animal detection at 4K 120, there is definitely a higher chance the camera would not automatically focus on the subject that you want to stay focused on. I usually do my autofocus test using the default autofocus settings. It means normal autofocus speed and sensitivity, but I tried to increase the autofocus sensitivity and speed and see what kind of difference it makes. With both autofocus settings set to maximum, autofocus definitely is a lot more responsive. Even when I run straight to the camera, it follows my movement almost instantly. When I'm filming in 4K 120 with maximum sensitivity and fastest autofocus setting, the camera's autofocus would follow my movements really fast. However, with the speed and sensitivity set to maximum, you do lose a bit of autofocus smoothness compared to using the default settings. The autofocus would just snap when it detects fast movement and there's also a bit more pausing as the camera is constantly trying to adjust its focus to follow movement as quickly as it can. So there's no magic best autofocus settings as it really depends on what you are shooting and what you prefer. Is it faster response or more stable smoother transition? So Play with the autofocus settings yourself and see what gives you the best overall result, something that you like the most. One downside of the Panasonic DFD autofocus system is that the performance highly depends on contrast. So in situations like when the subject is underexposed or overexposed, the autofocus performance will suffer and become not really reliable. To be fair, it is kind of true for all autofocus systems, but the DFD system performance is usually more sensitive to that. This is a problem that you may have seen when people are vlogging with the GH5 that the camera all of a sudden would focus on something in the background instead, especially when the lighting condition on the subject change, so the camera doesn't really know what to focus on. So this time I have done a bit of testing. I shot some video in vlogging style and I intentionally 
picked a very sunny day and did the test around midday so I can have some very strong very direct sunlight and some strong shadow and big changes in brightness and contrast on my face as I'm walking around and see how the camera handles it in terms of autofocus stability. I even tested one more time shooting in vlog picture profile as I had a bit of issues with that before when testing the S5 with the original firmware when shooting in vlog picture profile. I know Panasonic has since then released the new firmware to improve the vlog autofocus issue but I never have a chance to retest that. So now it's a good chance to test how the latest generation of DFD works on the GH6. And my results, as you can see, is really positive. All the footage that I shot on that day, no matter in standard picture profile or vlog profile, the focus stay on my face all the time. The autofocus is also very solid and stable, so not even much browsing at all. Definitely a good, solid, noticeable improvement. Another downside of DFD autofocus is that the autofocus performance would drop a bit when you are not using the lens from Panasonic. And it could be quite obvious when shooting in continuous autofocus mode. To see if it's any better on the GH6, I mounted my Olympus 60mm macro lens on the GH6 and shot a few videos using human detection to see what sort of results I can get. Turns out it works pretty good. The camera with the Olympus lens managed to follow the subject fairly quickly and smoothly despite my pretty shaky handheld camera movement holding a 60mm lens. Would it be better if I shot this with an equivalent Panasonic lens? Maybe, I don't know. But I'm pretty okay with the results I got from the Olympus lens. So over the last few years, I have done so many Panasonic autofocus tests pretty much every time when there was a new Lumix camera or new major firmware updates. I would test the autofocus again and it seems almost every six months or so there will be some sort of autofocus improvement just like this time. But how much has the DFD autofocus actually improved over the last few years and is it really much better than what it was a few years ago? I can't really answer that question easily. I think a good way you can find out would be to do a side-by-side -side comparison and testing the GH6 with the GH5 running the V1.0 firmware, the original firmware, then we can all see the difference if there's any. But the problem is, I don't really know of anyone that still has a GH5 that running the original version 1.0 firmware. Well, why would anyone do that? And you can't downgrade the firmware very easily. So I got another idea. I have a G85 and maybe I can use that instead. No, it's not a GH5, but if you have watched some of my autofocus tests that done back in 2018, the G85 and the GH5 had very similar autofocus performance back then. So doing a side by side, GH6 and G85 comparison would be probably the next best thing that I can do. My G85 is running a later firmware now, but since none of the G85 new firmware has any autofocus improvement, so yeah, autofocus performance is still back in the 2018 level. So that should be pretty much the same as the GH5 with the earlier firmware. Now let's look at these video clips. G85 versus GH6. 
you can see there is a huge difference between the autofocus performance of the GH6 and the G85. GH6 human detection is much faster and work from a much further distance. The yellow box follow the subject a lot closer. But most importantly, GH6 focus tracking indeed work much faster and more reliable, yet it is still very smooth. It may not be very obvious when I was moving slowly, but once I start moving quickly, the GH6 still managed to follow me very quickly, while the G85 would take much much longer to catch up my movement. I also rewatched some of my old autofocus test video, and I noticed that back then I was actually just slowly moving or walking in front of the camera when I did those tests, while these days, a lot of my tests, I was running towards the camera as fast as I can and moving very quickly in front of the camera. I was not really planning to do that. It's just something I think was subconsciously trying to push the autofocus harder and harder as I noticed its improvement over the years. So overall, it does show that Panasonic has made some huge improvement over the last few years for its DFD autofocus system. All those little steps add up and there's now a day and night difference between the GH6 and the original GH5, well, it's G85, DFD autofocus performance. And wait, I did one more test. If you think comparing the GH6 with a camera from 4 to 5 years ago is not really that useful, well, maybe. Um, I did one more test with one of the best camera in the market when it comes to autofocus. It's the Sony A1, the latest flagship from Sony. And we all know how good this camera's autofocus system is. And it sets the benchmark that every company is trying to match or try to beat. Of course, the A1 is also a lot more expensive than the GH6. You can buy almost three GH6 for the price of one Sony A1. Now, to be clear, even before I do the test, I definitely don't expect the GH6 would match the performance of the A1. The purpose of this test is just to see how big the gap is between these two cameras autofocus performance, especially for people who have been only shooting with Panasonic cameras. So it could be a good reality check to see what the best autofocus camera in the market can do. There are two things I'm interested in. One is the human detection that is drawing the box around the eye, the head or the body. And the other is once the camera has drawn the box, how good it actually managed to focus on that detect. So in terms of human detection that is drawing the box on the screen, I was a bit surprised because the Lumix GH6 actually seems to be a bit better than the Sony A1. On many occasions, the GH6 detects the eyes faster than the Sony, even when I enter from the left side, which means the Sony camera can see me first. But the GH6 managed to detect the eye a little bit faster than the Sony A1. GH6 also detects eye from further distance than the A1. And when I turn around, the GH6 also can detect my head. So in terms of detecting the subject and drawing the box around the subject, GH6 is surprisingly better than the A1. But drawing the box is one thing and actually focusing on the subject is more important. And I think it is very clear Sony A1 is really good at locking the focus on the subject once it is able to detect it. The A1 can follow me almost instantly all the time, no matter I pop into the scene or run towards the camera. And it does that very smoothly as well. But what about the GH6? Well, it is surely not as quick as the Sony A1. When both filming in 4K30, the GH6 usually takes about half a second to one second longer than the A1 to focus on my face when I suddenly appear in front of the camera. But when I'm doing normal walking and even running towards the camera, the difference is much smaller, sometimes almost not noticeable. The GH6 also seems to be very reliable as well, just like the A1. 
The only issue I notice with the GH6 is the focus does occasionally jumps a tiny bit when they try to catch up some fast movement. So it's not as smooth as the Sony sometimes. But overall, if you are shooting scenes that the camera or the subject is not moving very quickly, just moving at normal speed, you may not really notice much difference. So I'm quite surprised as I was expecting a much bigger difference, especially when filming at 4K30. But that's why I want to do a side-by-side -side test because this is the best way to see the actual difference. Now, I also tried setting GH6 autofocus speed and sensitivity to maximum and did another side-by-side -side test. And it does make GH6 autofocus performance even closer to the A1 in terms of speed and response. However, I do notice there is more focus jumping happening when I was moving very quickly. You can see the background was suddenly kind of pulse a bit when trying to catch up the very fast movement. So for me, I would prefer to use just the standard autofocus setting on the GH6. It may be half a second slower when someone suddenly pops up in front of the camera, but it gives me a smoother, more cinematic autofocus transition. By the way, because I'm trying to make this video as short as possible, so most of the autofocus test videos that I show you in this review are just very short clips that I cut from my much longer test. I've uploaded another GH6 autofocus video. If you want to watch the full length of this test footage, I put the link below and there are also a few other GH6 videos as well. So is the DFD perfect now? Well, no, of course not. Even Sony's autofocus has some certain weakness, so I definitely won't say Panasonic's DFD is perfect. But I honestly think it has reached the point that it is good and stable enough for most usage. I know some of you want to see face detection being added, and does that mean we will never see Panasonic incorporate face detection or other technology to their autofocus system? I even heard of people saying Panasonic can't use face detection because Sony doesn't sell the sensor or license technology to Panasonic. I can only say this is completely nonsense. But we need to understand adding face detection is not a magic bullet that if Panasonic does that, it would just make the autofocus works perfectly instantly. If you look at the market, Quite a few brands have been using face detection autofocus system for years and their camera still has quite average autofocus performance. Even Nikon has just managed to deliver excellent autofocus performance with the flagship Z9 very recently and Nikon has been relying on face detection from the DSR days and they have more than 10 mirrors camera using the face detection before the Z9 arrive. So what I want to say is, even if Panasonic has designed to add face detection or any other technology to work with DFD, it will still take time to make it work. When taking photos in AFS mode with mechanical shutter, maximum burst rate is 14 frames per second. That is two frames per second faster than the GH5, which is not bad. But in AFC mode, it is only 8 frames per second with the mechanical shutter, which is even 1 frame per second slower than the GH5. That is a bit disappointing, especially with the new processor and sensor. However, as I have shown you in the previous chapter, the success rate when shooting in AFC mode is pretty good, definitely much better than the GH5. So even though the burst speed is a bit lower, you quite likely end up with more or same amount of in-focus photo compared to the GH5. So overall, I think it is still a slight improvement, but honestly, I was hoping to see a bit more. Now, if you use the electronic shutter, it gets interesting. In AFC mode, the maximum burst speed is actually even slower at 7 frames per second, which is strange as most cameras these days are pushing the burst speed with the electronic shutter but GH6 is doing the opposite in AFC mode. However, if you shoot in AFS mode with the electronic shutter, 
you can shoot up to 75 frames per second and it is full resolution RAW or JPEG or both and you can take a maximum of 200 photos which is really good I say that because for a lot of cameras that has this kind of super burst mode they only have a small buffer so you need to time your shooting very carefully if you press the shutter slightly too early then you will fill up the buffer before the action even started or just started so it makes the super burst mode very very hard to use but since GH6 buffer is 200 photos which is almost 3 seconds it make it much easier and also a lot useful to use in real world the biggest limitation for this super burst mode is you have to use it in AFS mode so it is okay for shooting things that stay at a constant distance but not so good if the object is moving towards or away from you in high speed after you finish taking these photos the camera need time to write the photos to the memory card and writing 200 photos does take a bit of time when I tested using the Pagia 1TB CF Express card, it took about 38 seconds to clear the whole 200 photos buffer if I shot in RAW. And if I shot in RAW plus JPEG, then it would take almost exactly one minute. When the camera is clearing the buffer, you could still take more photos or go to the menu screen and change settings, but you cannot play back the photo or record video until everything is written to the card. Anyone wants to create good quality video content will know audio is just as important. With the GH6, Panasonic has made a few audio improvements. There is a new audio information button at the top which will bring up the audio information screen for you to check and change some of the audio settings very quickly. You can now also record 48 kHz 24 bit when you are recording in the MOV format. This is better than the typical 48 kHz 16 bit audio as there is 8 more bit per sample. 8 bit difference may not sound like a lot, but actually, there is a huge difference. 16 bit audio can only record 65,536 discrete values while 24-bit can record over 16.7 million discrete values. What it means is the record audio has much better audio resolution and dynamic range as well. If you use either the optional DMW MS2 shotgun mic or the DMW XLR1 XLR audio adapter, you can record audio in even better quality, 96 kHz, 24-bit. And with the XLR audio adapter, you can record four channel audio into the MOV file as well. Four channels give you more flexibility in terms of how you capture the audio. For example, you can use the extra channels to capture background audio, or you can use additional microphone to capture additional audio for backup. Especially if you're using wireless microphone as you may suffer from radio interference or some other unexpected audio issues. So if you use additional microphone and record to the additional channel, then you will have some backup audio that you can use. Comparing the GH6 with the GH5 Mark II, I found with the default microphone settings, the GH6 is slightly more quiet than the GH5 II using the default settings. The GH6 has a brand new 25 megapixel sensor. I don't think it is a stack sensor, at least I was not told by Panasonic. It is 25% higher resolution than the GH5's 20 megapixel sensor. I think it is quite a sensible jump as you do get some noticeable increase in resolution but not going really aggressive like 32 megapixel or higher which may have noticeable negative impact in low light performance or processing speed. The increase in resolution definitely would be welcome by photographers especially when you combine it with the high resolution mode which I will talk about next. 
but it also allowed the camera to output higher resolution video up to 5.8K. The biggest potential downside of a higher resolution sensor would be the high ISO performance might not be quite as good. But could the new processor and the latest sensor technology be able to offset that? Let's find out now. Okay, let's have a look at some photos first. Because I'm doing this review before the camera was released, I don't have any raw reader, so all the comparisons are based on JPEGs. From base ISO to ISO 1600, the JPEG looks really nice, very clean with all the details still retained. It. At ISO 3200, the JPEG still looks very nice and I only see very small amount of noise in the shadow area. At ISO 6400, I start to notice some small details, a loss, and there are some noticeable noise in the shadow. But overall, I think the image is still completely usable. When we bump up the ISO to 12800, a lot of details in the JPEG disappeared. And also, there is a bit more noise. But if I don't need to print it out large, the JPEG is still okay. At maximum ISO 25600, if we zoom in the photo, the JPEG is becoming a bit like a watercolor painting with not much fine details remaining in the photo. But is it still usable? I say it depends. If I just need to post it on social media or things like that, I think it is still fine. One thing that I'm quite impressed is, if I compare the photo shot at ISO 1600 and ISO 25600, there isn't that much difference in terms of colors and contrast. And here are some comparison of the JPEG from the GH6, GH52, GH5S and G85. I have resampled all the JPEG to match the GH5S resolution. The G85 with the 16 megapixel sensor is surely the worst at high ISO. Then the GH52 is a bit better. The GH5S and the GH6 are both quite good with the GH5S managed to retain the most amount of fine details but also a bit more noise and GH6 seems to have the best overall in terms of details, noise, contrast and colors. I actually feel Panasonic could push one more stop to ISO 51200 if they want but maybe they are just a bit conservative. Okay, now let's have a look at 4K videos and we start at ISO 1600. At ISO 1600, the image quality is really good. Excellent details, good color, good contrast, and I don't really see any noise at all. Go up to ISO 3200, the image quality is really pretty much the same. At ISO 6400, I starting to see more noise in some of the shadow area, but overall image quality is still quite decent. At ISO 12800, which is the maximum ISO for shooting video, noise become more noticeable and not just in the shadow area. You can see noise in pretty much the whole video. But to be honest, the overall image quality is still very acceptable. And if I compare the GH6 with a few other Michael Forford cameras, the 16 megapixel G85 high ISO performance is once again not quite as good as the other cameras. The GH6 does a better job at controlling ISO than the GH52, but the 12 megapixel oversized sensor GH5S still deliver slightly better image quality than the GH6 at ISO 12800. And just like for the photos, I feel Panasonic could probably push one more stop and allow user to go up to ISO 25600. The image quality won't be great if you push another stop, that's for sure. But I have a feeling it should still be usable if you are shooting documentary or some other type of video that doesn't really need the best image quality. But anyway, I think overall, both the JPEG and the video from this 25 megapixel sensor looks pretty decent even at ISO 6400. And I would be happy to go up to ISO 12800 when shooting under low light. The GH6 uses a new ultra high precision gyro for its in-body image stabilizer. And Panasonic has also improved the software algorithm as well. 
As a result, Panasonic claims the IBIS on the GH6 is now 7.5 stop effective. That is one of the highest rated IBIS in the industry. And interestingly, it is even higher than the just announced OM system OM1, which the IBIS itself is only 7 stop effective. And I tested for both photo and video. And first, let me show you my results from taking photos at 60 mil focal length using IBIS only. From this chart, you can see GH6 IBIS is about 5 stops effective. While it's not exactly the clamp 7.5 stop figure, my IBIS test result never really match any official figures and always a little bit lower. But at least I do see around one stop improvement compared to the GH5 Mark II, which is pretty much what I expected. And it is very impressive considering how good GH5 Mark II's IBIS is already. And how about when shooting video? Once again, I did some side-by-side -side comparison tests with a few cameras. For each test, I mounted two cameras on a solid rig and I hold them together and walk just normally as I record the test footage. So I didn't do any ninja walking to try and minimize the camera shake at all. And the GH6 IBIS is really good. Even with me walking normally and shooting with a 25mm non-stabilized lens, that means it's not using dual IS, just the IBIS, the footage from the GH6 still looks very smooth. And then I mounted the Lumix lens with optical image stabilizer onto the camera. So we have dual IS2 now, and that makes the image even smoother. GH6 dual IS2 footage is noticeably smoother than GH5 Mark II's dual IS2 footage as well. They are less bouncing. I was expecting the difference to be smaller or maybe not even noticeable, but turns out I can see the difference quite easily. Then I compare the GH6 with some full frame cameras. First one is the Lumix S5, which when I tested last time was better than the Nikon Z6 Sony A7 III, but not as good as the Lumix S1H. Now look at this side by side test footage. There is a huge difference between the two cameras. The GH6 IBIS is way better than the S5 and the difference is very, very obvious. GH6 excellent IBIS make the S5 IBIS look quite bad. However, the biggest difference and surprise to me is actually when I compared it with the Sony A1. The flagship Sony camera, its footage looks so shaky that I actually redo my test to make sure I did indeed turn on the IBIS on the A1 and didn't do anything wrong. But the results from my second test was the same. So yes, the Sony A1's IBIS does look really average when you compare it side by side with the Lumix GH6. But I want to remind you guys that all this IBIS test footage I show you were shot at 25 mil focal length, which is 50 mil full frame equivalent. And I was walking normally, so I was really pushing the IBIS quite hard. Here is another test to show you the Boost IS feature on the GH6 that is basically asking the IBIS to keep the image as steady as possible. The test video was shot at 200 mil, so it's 400 mil full frame equivalent. Without any stabilization, the footage is really quite shaky as you can expect it. And once I enable the Boost IS, the video is unbelievably stable. I was standing and hand holding the camera with nothing else to support me or the camera. For photographers, one of the major upgrades that comes with the GH6 is the high resolution photo mode, which creates 100 megapixel photo from multiple shots. High resolution mode captures more details, better colors, less noise, and also can help you get rid of the moray pattern as well. Have a look at this comparison photo. One is a normal photo and the other one is a high resolution photo. Both shot at the same time using the GH6 with the same settings. If we zoom in and compare them, you can see the high resolution photo just captures a lot more details. Just look at the white fence and especially the shadow area. The high resolution shot just retains a lot more fine details, has less noise and just much 
cleaner and sharper. Now, while the GH6 is not the first camera and not even the first Panasonic camera that has the high resolution mode, what is different and great about the GH6 is that it allows you to just handheld the camera and shot the high resolution photo without using a tripod. And the high resolution photo is the same at 100 megapixel. This is something a lot of us have been waiting for and it makes this high resolution mode a lot more useful because I don't know about you guys, but for me, when I go out, I don't usually carry a tripod, especially when I carry a micro four foot camera. That usually means I want something lighter and easier to carry. But with all the previous Lumix cameras, it means I can't shoot in high resolution mode because I don't have a tripod with me. But with this new handheld high resolution mode, we could shoot high resolution photos pretty much anytime, anywhere we want. And as mentioned before, there is now a new position on the camera's mode dial for you to assess the high resolution mode directly. This is a lot better than the previous Panasonic cameras as they require you to enable that in the menu system. I imagine when shooting handheld, the high resolution mode would work better at the wider focal length because there would be less impact from the camera shape. So to see how well the handheld mode works in real life, I tested it at different focal length, starting from 12mm, then 24mm, 50mm, 100mm and 200mm. I took 5 high resolution photos handheld at each focal length and compare the high resolution mode output to the normal one. I took 5 photos at each focal length for two reasons. One is for me to see what is the sharpest photo that I can get at each focal length. And the second reason is for me to spot if there's any major consistency or reliability issue when shooting at a particular focal length. So when I check the photos, I can say for all the different focal length from 12mm to 200mm, Every single handheld high resolution photos capture more details than the normal resolution photo. The wider the focal length, the more noticeable improvement in sharpness from the high resolution photo. But even the photo shot at 200mm focal length, which is 400mm full frame equivalent, I still can see more details in the high resolution photo very easily. So that is very impressive. If I compare the normal photo, with the high resolution photo shot on a tripod and the high resolution photo shot handheld, the tripod high resolution photo is clearly the one with the best image quality. The handheld high resolution photo is really not bad and it also gives you all the benefits like less noise, better colors and also help get rid of the moray patterns. And one more tip. Pay attention to the shutter speed when taking handheld high resolution photo. Because if your shutter speed is too slow, there is a higher chance that you will introduce some camera shake, not just during the shot, but also in between different shots and that would affect the merge result. But of course, if you just focus on increasing the shutter speed, then you may end up bumping up the ISO too much or shooting in too fast aperture, which also would have a negative impact to the image quality. So just keep that in mind when you are taking the high resolution handheld photo and pick the camera settings more carefully. Panasonic said the new 25 megapixel sensor on the GH6 has a faster readout speed and that's one of the reasons why it can now do 4K 120 recording and using the full with sensor as well. Faster readout speed also should mean less rolling shutter. Rolling shutter is the general effect that you will see when you are panning the camera horizontally and suddenly all the vertical edges are not vertical lines anymore. I did some tests and compared the GH6 with the Lumix GH5 Mark II and see if there's actually any difference in terms of rolling shutter. So I have both cameras mounted on a solid rig again and I pan them at the same time. 
I shot this test video at 4K30 on both cameras with high shutter speed. I did pan the camera quite quickly as I want to see the rolling shutter so that I can compare. If it's a bit hard to see, let me slow down the footage a bit. To be honest, it's still a bit hard to see, so I paused the video twice, once when the cameras were panning at each direction, and I used Photoshop to measure the rolling shutter angle. The GH6 does have less rolling shutter than the GH5 II, about 10% less in terms of degrees in both of my measurements. It is not a huge improvement, but since the GH5 Mark II's rolling shutter is not bad at all, so it's still a good improvement. However, as I was playing around with the recording options, I noticed one interesting thing. Look at this comparison video, still GH6 versus GH5 Mark II. The GH5 Mark II was still using the same setting as before, so that's 4K30, as I want to keep it as my reference camera but I switched the GH6 to 10-bit 4K 120. Now, the angle of the vertical lines from the GH6 is about 50% less than the GH5 Mark II. Comparing to before, when filming in 4K 30, it was only 10% less, so there is a huge difference. So that means the rolling shutter become much smaller when you are filming in 4K 120. Interestingly, shooting in 10-bit 4K 60 with the GH6 the rolling shutter appeared to be identical to shooting in 4K30. When I compared it with the Lumix S5, this time I don't even need to go to Photoshop and I can already see the difference. The GH6 has much less rolling shutter even at 4K30. The angle caused by the rolling shutter is about two-thirds the value of the S5. Panasonic camera, especially the flagship GH series are usually really good when it comes to heat management. I remember when I went to the GH5 launch event many years ago, Panasonic told me they spent a lot of effort to avoid the GH5 from overheating using various passive cooling techniques. And this time with the GH6, Panasonic has added active cooling which use a cooling fan to get cold air into the back of the camera and help cool down the internal temperature. And because of that, Panasonic says the camera can do unlimited recording without overheating even when you are doing 10-bit 4K60 simultaneous internal and external recording. So I did another test. I set up the GH6 on a tripod and set the recording to internal 10-bit 4K120. And I tried to make the camera work harder by turning on the in-body image stabilizer as well as setting the autofocus to continuous autofocus. The cooling fan mode set to auto 2, which means the cooling fan speed would just depends on the camera's internal temperature and it will stop if it's not needed. Right now, it is summer here in New Zealand. So that day that I did the test, the ambient temperature was around 28 degrees Celsius, which is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was not super hot, but it's still quite warm. I measured the temperature of the back of the camera every 10 to 15 minutes during the recording. The temperature of the back of the camera raised from around 31 degrees Celsius at the start to around 35 degrees after 20 minutes or so, and the cooling fan started working. But after that, the temperature didn't really change much at all. And after 2.5 hours of continuous 4K 120 recording, the temperature was still around 35 degrees. So when I touched the back of the camera, it was not even warm, just pretty much the room temperature. So I stopped the recording after 2 hours 30 minutes as there really isn't much point to continue the recording. Then I removed the CF Express card from the camera immediately. The card was a bit warm, but it's only around 40 degrees Celsius. So this is great as a lot of cameras that I tried over the last two years or so had overheat issues when recording higher than 4K 30. The Canon R5 overheat about 30 minutes last time I tried. And the day when I was testing the IBIS, 
I did some side by side tests with the Sony A1. It was a 27 degrees Celsius day, so even slightly cooler than the day that I did the overheat test. Somehow, after about 20 minutes of using the A1, not even recording all the time, I already see the overheating warning icon on A1's screen. Now, I understand that is more a precautionary warning and the camera still works fine, but the A1 indeed feel quite warm already, while the G6, which I have been using much longer as I was testing it against all the other cameras, the cooling fan wasn't even running yet. After such a long wait, we finally have the GH6. So is it worth the wait? When the GH5 was released back in 2017, the camera market was very different to what it is today. Canon and Nikon still wasn't that serious about mirrorless cameras and shops still selling more DSLR than mirrorless cameras. But now in 2022, things are very different. All the major camera manufacturers have pretty much gave up the DSLR market and heavily focus on mirrorless cameras. We have a lot of full frame mirrorless cameras like the Canon R6, Sony A7 IV, Nikon Z6 II, or even Panasonic's own S1. They are all just slightly more expensive than the GH6, but they have a sensor that is four times the size of the GH6. So would it be better off to get one of those full frame cameras instead? Especially the size of the GH6 is pretty much the same as most of these full frame cameras. I have been asking myself this question when I was working on this review and it is not easy to answer. For most people, I think it is really tempting to get a full frame camera for similar price and if you are someone who loves the ultra shallow depth of field look or you want usable 6 digits ISO, GH6 really can't compete with the full frame cameras. If that's what you want the most, getting the full frame camera and a fast lens would be your best choice. But on the other hand, you can only get the better high ISO benefit if your photo or video allow the shallower depth of field. If you need a bit more depth of field, then quite often you have to stop down your lens when you are shooting with a full frame camera. Then basically you are giving up most of the benefits of a full frame camera. For example, if you need to shoot a nice scene of a group of people at f4 on a full frame camera to get enough depth of field, with a micro four thirds camera like the GH6, you can shoot at f2 with the equivalent focal length. So with the same shutter speed, the full frame camera may be shooting at ISO 12800, then the GH6 only need to shoot at ISO 3200. In this case, there really wouldn't be any noticeable difference in terms of image quality. Full frame camera sensor usually do have better dynamic range. However, the new dynamic range boost mode on the GH6 does help it to reduce the gap a bit, at least for the video shooting. If you are a casual videographer, to be honest, any of these full frame mirrorless cameras has enough video feature to keep you happy. But if you are more serious about videography, the unlimited recording with no overheating, full sensor with output even when recording internal 10-bit 4K 120 is already a good reason to choose the GH6 over any of this camera under US $3,000 price range. You can also shoot up to 5.8K 60p or 300 frames per second 1080p and everything can be recorded in 10-bit internal. There's also the new ProRes, ProRes HQ 5.7K internal recording options. The in-body image stabilizer is also excellent with the GH6. For some kind of video, you could probably get away without using a gimbal and combine that with the lighter micro four foot lenses that make the GH6 a really great run and gun camera that is very lightweight and very easy to carry around it. There are also a bunch of other features like the tele lamp, 
front recording button, in and out time code, and the Morphix support. These are all very useful features for videographers that pretty much none of the other camera at similar price can offer. Continuous autofocus for video has been the biggest weakness for Panasonic for a long time, but I think people would be really surprised by how well GH6 DFD autofocus system works. It is not the fastest or it is not the most responsive, but it is pretty reliable. It detects and tracks the subject very nicely under most situations. So surely it's not the best, but it should be good enough for most of us. I do feel Panasonic could have done a bit more for photographers. I'm not sure if Panasonic is just saving something so they could release a G9 II or other high spec photo centric camera in the future. But the GH6 is a heavily video centric camera as most of the big changes and upgrades are for video shooters. Now I'm not saying there isn't much improvement for photographers. You still get the brand new 25 megapixel sensor, the 100 megapixel handheld high resolution mode, 75 frames per second burst mode in AFS with 200 frames buffer. The improved continuous autofocus performance and IBIS would also benefit photographers, and the new processor also improved the image processing. But I would like to see a new electronic viewfinder, less or no blackout when shooting in burst mode, and maybe faster burst speed in AFC mode. Having said that, if you are a photographer currently shooting with the Lumix G9 or GH5, there are still just enough reason for you to consider upgrade to the GH6. It's just, if you don't shoot video at all, Buying the GH6 doesn't seem to be the most cost-effective upgrade option. But on the other hand, for videographers, I think the GH6 is the best camera you can buy at this price range, if you consider all the features and the overall performance. Thank you very much for watching this video, especially if you managed to watch the whole review. If you enjoyed this review, please give it a like and drop a comment to support me and this channel. I've also uploaded a few other GH6 videos on my channel to share with you more of my test results. So check them out if you are interested. And I will have more GH6 and Micro Four First content coming in the future. So please subscribe if you are interested. Thank you very much again for watching this video. And if you have any questions about GH6, please drop a comment below.